Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience. It's uh, uh, obviously been a long afternoon, uh, and I just wanted to uh, make sure that before I came out to you, I could provide you with uh, as much updated information as possible. I don't have an opening statement uh, to make, and uh, in the interest of moving this along, I'll go straight to questions. Well, I, I, have a, I can anticipate some of your questions. So uh, it was uh, the kind of information that I hope will be responsive to your questions, at least in part, that I uh, sought and found. Julie. Thanks, Jay. Um, can you tell us what uh, the President and Steve Bannier discussed in their phone call? Yes, I can. The President did uh, call and speak with uh, the Speaker of the House this afternoon, not long ago. Uh, had a, a good conversation, and the two of them agreed that uh, all sides need to keep talking uh, on the issues here that are confronting us that have uh, led to a shutdown of the government and to the uh, situation that has put us on the precipice of, uh, you know, potential default or at least reaching that line beyond which the United States government does not have borrowing authority. So, uh, you know, the President believes that in his meetings yesterday with House Republican leaders and today with Senate Republicans, as well as, of course, with uh, House and Senate Democrats, that you know, we've had, there have been constructive talks. And when it comes to the House Republicans in particular, there is uh, an indication, anyway, of a recognition that we need to uh, remove default as a weapon in budget negotiations, that the threat of default uh, should not be used, and certainly default itself is never an option. Uh, and the President appreciates the constructive nature of the conversation and of the proposal that uh, House Republicans uh, put forward. He has some concerns with it, and I'll simply say that without reading, I'm not going to read out details of conversations or the phone calls, uh, but that our position, the President's position, that you know we uh, the United States should not, and the American people cannot, uh, pay a ransom in exchange for Congress doing its job remains uh, as true today as it, as it has been throughout this period. When you talk about a House Republican proposal, are you talking about the proposal that they presented in the meeting yesterday, or are you talking about this new proposal from them that uh, would increase the debt ceiling short term, also reopen the government, and then in exchange uh, include some cuts in benefit programs? Well, again, I don't think, I'm not aware of multiple proposals. I think that there has been a have, general discussion, and I'm not going to get into details, I will simply say that uh, the President has long believed and has insisted that we cannot allow a situation where one party in one House uses the threat of default to try to extract concessions through budget negotiations. And it is his position that the right thing to do is to remove that gun from the table, uh, extend the debt ceiling uh, in a way that uh, ensures that w there is no suggestion or hint uh, that uh, default is an option uh, because our economy can't uh, endure that kind of approach to resolving our budget differences. And, uh, you know, a proposal that puts uh, a debt ceiling increase uh, at only six weeks tied to bu budget negotiations uh, would put us right back where we are today in just six weeks uh, on the verge of Thanksgiving and the obviously important uh, shopping season leaving, leading up to the holidays. And, and that would create you know, enormous uncertainty for our economy. The President, uh, speaking with small business owners, uh, heard from them that you know, the continued threat of default uh, into that season would be very damaging to them. And we can't, uh, we, we don't think that's the right you way said to go. yesterday, though, that the President would likely sign a short-term mm -hmm. debt ceiling increase. That still stands, is that correct? He, yes, here's what we, but let's be clear about what his position has been and what I've said. Uh, it is the very least that Congress could do to pass the legislation that would raise the debt ceiling for a short term and pass legislation that would uh, fund the government uh, for a short term as the Senate has already passed. And uh, the President has believed that, as I think I've stated many times, that we should raise the debt ceiling for longer than that, as the Senate has proposed and will vote on soon, uh, because we should not link 
the threat of default to budget negotiations. Uh, he's very eager to engage in budget negotiations. That's been something he's amply demonstrated all year long and is reflected in the budget proposal he made earlier this year. Uh, but we should not have a situation, a dynamic that has led to where we are now, that led to what we saw in the summer of 2011 and that would be recreated in six weeks if we had to once again go through a process where one party was trying to extract concessions in budget negotiations in return for lifting the debt ceiling. I just want to try one more time. There, mm -hmm. there was a proposal that the House Republicans came to the White House with yesterday for their meeting. And then House Republicans say there was a new proposal that they presented to White House staff last night that also included uh, reopening the government. The White House has received mm -hmm. that proposal. But I'm, not, I'm not disputing that. I, uh, but I'm, what I'm saying like the is... White House's position, you're, it sounds like you're not uh, accepting that proposal. I just want to make sure we can clarify that. What the President and the Speaker agreed on in their phone conversation is that uh, everybody should keep talking. And the President appreciates the constructive approach uh, the, uh, that we've been seeing, uh, and that is certainly a change and a welcome change. And uh, he hopes that an agreement can be reached. In relation to the proposal that has been discussed in the press, uh, it is our view that uh, we cannot have a situation where we, the debt ceiling is extended uh, as part of a budget negotiation process for only six weeks, which would put us right back in the same position that we're in now. Uh, and I think, I know that this is not uh, uncomplicated, but a clean debt ceiling increase for six weeks with no conditions attached to it is distinct from one that links it to a budget negotiation and the continued threat of default as a point of leverage in a budget negotiation, which is just, again, continually uh, putting the American economy at risk uh, in an effort to achieve some partisan advantage, which uh, we can't do. And furthermore, when it comes to the various proposals that have been discussed, it's certainly our view, as it has always been, that there is no reason to keep the government shut down. The President wants to involve, engage in constructive budget negotiations. He has seen indications from Republicans in both the Senate and the House in uh, the last 24 hours that they, too, are interested in engaging in serious budget negotiations where we can uh, achieve some of the goals that he put forward in his budget proposal, uh, buying down the sequester, uh, investing uh, in areas of our economy that will help it grow and protect the middle class. Uh, you know, continuing the work of reducing our deficit and addressing our long-term debt. Uh, and uh, he very much looks forward to that. Uh, but there's no reason to not open the government uh, right away, in his view. Jay, do you feel like your, your close <coughs> agreement are, is beginning anywhere at all in these talks? I think that the talks have been uh, constructive and that there is a recognition, uh, at least uh, among some Republicans uh, and Republican leaders, that shutdown is not good for the American people and it's not good for the American economy, that uh, the threat of default uh, is damaging to the economy and default itself would be uh, catastrophically damaging to the economy and the American people, and that uh, those, they, that acknowledgement and those realizations have helped create an environment where uh, it at least looks like there's the possibility of making some progress here. The President's view is that, that we have to again, remove these, you know, sort of demands for, uh, you know, leverage using essentially the American people and the economy uh, in order to achieve what one side is seeking through negotiations and simply engage in the negotiations. Don't punish the American people uh, because we here in Washington have a different points of view about how we should in uh, invest moving forward and how, what way we, sh you know, what mechanisms we can employ to uh, further reduce our deficits. So, uh, again, the talks have been, and I think this is important because it is a market difference from where we had been, the talks have been constructive and the President appreciates uh, the uh, approach that the Speaker and others have taken. And, and is the biggest, ha you mentioned this a couple of times, is the biggest hang up now the, the length of the debt ceiling extension? Uh, again, the, the, the President has, you know, a, a number of concerns uh, with the proposal. The, uh, although there are other parts of the proposal that, you know, he thinks reflects uh, areas that we can, you know, find constructive agreement. And by we, I mean not just the President and the Speaker, but any kind of budget deal would have to pass through both houses of Congress, and that means agreement uh, 
among both Democrats and Republicans in both houses. Uh, the uh, one issue that I mentioned just now is that tying the extension of the debt ceiling for only six weeks to budget negotiations creates a dynamic uh, that is very similar to the one we're experiencing now and very similar to the one that the country experienced back in 2011. And uh, it has been the President's position, and it is one that he uh, holds to this day, that that's uh, not the appropriate way to go and that we ought to remove uh, Congress, Republicans ought to you know, remove the threat of default uh, as a uh, point of leverage in budget negotiations because they're only doing harm to the American economy, they're only doing harm to the American people, and, uh, you know, the President cannot, as he said so many times, pay ransom in exchange for Congress doing its fundamental, fulfilling its fundamental responsibility, which is to ensure that the United States doesn't default and that it pays its bills. And, what, and lastly, what did he tell Senate Republicans this morning? We saw that Senator Cornyn said that it was a predictable lecture. Well, I think I saw some other uh, senators, the Republican senators, speak positively about the meeting, and the President felt that that was also a constructive meeting. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure uh, about Senator Cornyn's comments, except to say that uh, certainly he, the Senator should have expected the President to express his views on how we ought to move forward. Uh, I don't think Republican senators have held back or Republican House members have held back when expressing how, you know, they think we ought to move forward. The whole point is we need to have constructive uh, negotiations about our budget choices, uh, not under a cloud that threatens default or continued government shutdown. Jay? Jim. Uh, I mean, Jim. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the administration's concerns with the Republican proposal. What is the White House putting on the table? What do you see as the most realistic proposal in terms of getting something done here? It is our position that uh, there is no uh, acceptable reason to keep the government shut down. It, all it does is does, you know, harm Americans who are out there trying to make ends meet, harm the economy, uh, and, they ought, and that the government ought to be reopened. So our position hasn't changed there, and our position on the debt ceiling hasn't changed, which is that uh, it ought to be removed by Congress as a, uh, a tool or a, uh, a cudgel uh, in budget negotiations, because in the precedent created in 2011, Republicans have uh, now, for the second time, used the threat of default uh, in an attempt to extract concessions uh, that they could not uh, extract through normal legislative means or through the election process. So uh, that's unacceptable. Uh, not, and it's not personal. It's not about this president. It's un unacceptable as a governing mechanism for this country moving forward because it would create a scenario where uh, quarter after quarter or biannually or yearly we would have these manufactured crises and the crises alone, whether there was default or not, do harm to our economy. Slow growth, reduce job creation, squeeze the middle class, squeeze small businesses, uh, and it's just not the way to do business. And I think you're seeing among uh, a number of lawmakers, uh, both in the Senate and the House, who are Republicans, a recognition that, uh, that that's not the right approach to take uh, when we have, uh, you know, sincerely held opinions about the kinds of decisions we need to make to uh, move forward with our budget and our deficit reduction. You said the position hasn't changed on the shutdown, the position hasn't changed on the debt ceiling. How is that negotiating? I, I, Jim, I, look, the President has had constructive conversations with House and Senate Republicans. He's also had, you know, very good conversations with House and Senate Democrats. The, his position that it's unacceptable to demand a ransom from the American people in return for not defaulting, it's not going to change. And it's not going to change now, and it's not going to change in six weeks, and it's not going to change uh, at any point during his presidency. Nor does he expect that any of his successors will take a different uh, position. What has always been true is that this President is willing to sit down and roll up his sleeves and work out a common sense uh, budget agreement with Republicans that embodies both uh, his objectives and Republican objectives in, in, in a compromise, that a compromise that uh, achieves not everything he wants and achieves not everything that Republicans want, but uh, through a compromise, achieves what the American people and the American economy uh, deserve, which is. You're, you're waiting for the white flag. 
You're no, waiting for Jim, total you, capitulation. You, look, I, you guys want to turn this into a game of winners and losers. And the, 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 the President made clear the other day that, that in a situation where the government is shut down and the, you know, one party in Congress is threatening default and some of their loudest voices are encouraging default, nobody wins. Nobody wins. Uh, he wants uh, a situation where we can discuss and debate our differences and reach uh, an agreement that reflects a willingness by both sides to compromise uh, in, on behalf of the American people and the American economy. And he believes it is possible. And he believes that uh, although we're not there yet and there's not an agreement, that uh, there are indications in these last 24 hours from Republicans uh, that of a new willingness to explore that possibility. John. First on a totally different subject, um, as a Nobel laureate, does the President <laughs> think the Nobel Committee blew it by not giving the Nobel Peace Prize to Malala Yousafzai? Let me say first uh, that we'll be putting out a statement, but I wanted to say that President Obama congratulates uh, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the OPCW, on being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, which reinforces the international community's commitment to the international prohibition against the use of chemical weapons. One of the President's highest priorities is to prevent the proliferation or use of weapons of mass destruction. And this award honors those who make it their life's work uh, to advance this vital goal. Since its establishment 16 years ago, the OPCW has stood at the forefront of the international community's efforts to verifiably eliminate some of the world's most dangerous weapons. Today's award recognizes that commitment and reinforces the trust and confidence the world has placed in the OPCW, uh, in its Director General, and, and uh, the courageous OPCW experts and inspectors taking on the unprecedented challenge uh, right now of eliminating Syria's chemical weapons program. Uh, the U.S. strongly supports the OPCW, including its joint work with the United Nations, to ensure that Syria's chemical weapons stockpiles are placed under international control and ultimately destroyed. Today, we again call on all nations to work to bring to an end the conflict that has cost the lives of more than 100,000 Syrians and to support the OPCW's efforts in the hope that future generations can live uh, in a world free from the horrors of chemical weapons. Uh, in answer to your question, uh, that young woman's uh, courage, uh, courage uh, and efforts are remarkable, and the President absolutely honors them, uh, as so many people around the world do. So he doesn't think the Nobel Committee blew it? Uh, look, I don't think I the President. I mean, some people say she's like the most, you know. Uh, I think the President, uh, you know, as I just noted, <laughs> congratulates the winner uh, of the Nobel Peace Prize and uh, obviously thinks that there's an enormous amount of good work being done uh, around the world uh, on behalf of peace, and uh, uh, all of it should be recognized. Um, so the, the Republicans started this all off by demanding full defunding of uh, the Affordable Care Act in exchange for funding the government for six weeks, a uh, whole la laundry list of Republican priorities uh, in exchange for raising the debt ceiling. Is it your sense, given where we are now, that Republicans have backed down? John, I would just say, as I mentioned before, that it's, it's not really how it should be viewed, you know, that it's a win-lose, zero-sum competition uh, because uh, there are losers regardless in, in a process like this where uh, the government is shut down, default is threatened, and the President wants that dynamic to change. I mean, his, he has made so very clear his willingness to negotiate and reach a compromise with Republicans on uh, a longer-term budget deal. But he doesn't think that it's appropriate to exact a price from the American people or to punish the American economy in an effort to try to uh, tip the balance of those discussions and negotiations uh, by Republicans. And uh, he's been pretty firm about that. He's encouraged by some of the developments that we've seen. Uh, and he agrees with the Speaker that we need to continue talking and hopes that we can reach a resolution here that removes the threat of default from the table uh, for a considerable duration. That's certainly the President's view. 
uh, allows the government to reopen as soon as possible, put people back to work, and end this situation where there are terrible consequences occurring every day that we all hear about and, and you report on. Uh, and then we can get about the business of hammering out a compromise that, uh, if achieved, will we'll give each side uh, something to be proud of, something to point to and say, you know, we got that because uh, we thought it was so important and we were willing to work with the President and the Democrats, uh, this is the Republicans speaking, uh, on, on what, you know, they insisted was important and we reached a compromise. And, and if we can do that, uh, you know, on a longer term, how long obviously depends on what those negotiations look like. It would be good for the American people and good for the economy. But virtually none of those original Republican demands are on the table still, are they? Again, when it comes to threatening the full faith and credit of the United States, no demand, no matter how small, is acceptable. You have to ex accept the basic premise that using that as leverage is, is highly damaging to the economy and to the American middle class. And uh, you know, I think that we've, again, seen over the course of the last several days and, and uh, weeks uh, a developing recognition that this, going down this path is not, was not the right way to go. And uh, uh, for all the reasons that it, that, and lessons that we learned back in 2011. And then uh, one last thing with apologies to Josh. Uh, can, can you explain to me how it is that West Wing Week is still being produced? I mean, is that really a central government service that well, is not I, shut down as part of the shutdown? I would refer you to the Office of Management and Budget in terms of what, how, uh, they don't mention who's accepted. The, uh, well, you know, I, you can weekly video webcast call the uh, the OMB, but the um, you know the communications office obviously is significantly slimmed down, as are so many offices here. Uh, but uh, communications are a part of uh, what we need to do at the White House. Jim, yeah, uh, is it fair to say that the conversation now is about not whether to avoid default, but the duration? That is what is being I think it passed is. back and forth in, the, in these conversations. I'm not going to put any sure, sure. terminology on it that everyone is very sensitive to mm -hmm. negotiating, but whatever it is, there's an agreement to avoid default, and the central issue is for how long? Well, I, I would, without getting into depth uh, about conversations that I don't right. want to read out, I would simply say that uh, based on what you've heard from Republican leaders uh, in both houses, there, there is a recognition that uh, devo default is not an acceptable outcome uh, and uh, not an option. And uh, it, it, it is true that, you know, we don't think uh, uh, there's, uh, we have great concerns about any proposition that would tie uh, the next extension of the debt ceiling directly to budget negotiations in six weeks right before we have uh, the most important retail Obviously season. It's about something longer than that. It is absolutely our view that uh, we should remove renewal of the debt ceiling or extension of the debt ceiling uh, from this conversation, that the threat of default uh, should not be uh, part of negotiations. That's been our position all along. Right. As in the last 24 hours, a discussion about reopening the government for a period of time longer than had been previously discussed, which is either two months or three months, mm -hmm. is that also now commingled with this conversation about extending the debt limit, meaning for a longer period of that, what we're really talking about now is not weather, but duration? No, I mean, I think there's more to it than duration. Our view is uh, the government ought to be reopened right away. It should have been reopened yesterday. It should never have been shut down. It is our view that the debt ceiling uh, the commitment by the Congress to pay our bills should right. be renewed uh, but, but right away. All of us are trying yeah. to figure out what is the central element of these conversations and what is the goal, uh, the goal that both sides are bringing. And so it seems to me fair to ask you, not, mm -hmm. we're not really talking about whether to do these things, but for how long, and then what's the framework of negotiations mm -hmm. that attach to that on uh, Well, I think broadly, think, uh, broadly okay, speaking, that that, characterization? that's fair, but obviously there's a lot more to it than that. What, uh, you know, what we think is not the right way to go is to try again, uh, after we've just been through this and after we went through it two years, to link extension of the debt ceiling uh, to budget negotiations and therefore link 
the possibility of default to whether or not one side gets what it wants in those budget negotiations because so there has to be a clear delineation of that. Well, we believe the president to. supports uh, a position and that's reflected in that direction. Would you say? Well, I'm not going to speak for the Republicans except to say that we think the talks have been constructive and we think that Republican leaders are uh, looking for a way to uh, extend the debt ceiling and to uh, fund the government. You know, we just need to, con they need to continue talking. There needs to be continued uh, discussions on Capitol Hill, and right. we'll see where we get. Our view is that, uh, the President's view is that we ought to, uh, there is no reason, there's no actually reason I have even seen logically articulated by Republicans for why we, they insist on, or would insist on continuing to shut the government down. Uh, so, because there's only, uh, I mean, the, uh, you know, average folks out there are paying the price, and the economy is paying the price. and. That ought to be. So these talks are now about resolving both. Well, again, I'm not going to characterize conversations that are taking place on Capitol Hill or here in any great detail, except to reiterate what our okay. firm position has right. been. Tomorrow could be a, a very in, interesting, <coughs> possibly important day because House Republicans have said they're going to have a vote on <coughs> debt limit extension one way or the other. It'll either be the original thing they brought here yesterday, which is November 22nd, or something that would reflect what is now, I believe, being jointly discussed, something that's longer and more comprehensive and possibly that could be described as a, as a deal. Does that com comport with your understanding that well, I, the, I, the timeline would be something by tomorrow and that a lot of work will be going really, on this night? I tonight. really can honestly say that I don't know if and when the House is going to act on any proposed legislation. Uh, is there a sense what of I can tell you about getting things done tonight? Uh, the President just spoke with the Speaker. Uh, the President obviously met with uh, Senate Republicans and has now met with, uh, you know, members of both parties of both houses and will continue, uh, broadly, will continue to have conversations and, and what's important here is that everyone recognize that default is not an option. How about momentum? And that, well, we're obviously uh, in a better place than we were a few days ago in terms of the constructive approach that uh, we've seen uh, of late, but there's not an agreement, and you know it's our view, the president's view, that we ought to just uh, that the Congress ought to and the House ought to allow the government to reopen and to uh, you know pass a bill that raises the debt ceiling, and, and so that it's clear to everyone that we can't use that, that no party should use the threat of default. Uh, as leverage to try to achieve something through budget negotiations. I mean, that, look, the, you know, we're a country where there are two dominant parties and uh, each is substantially represented here in Washington and, you know, budget negotiations and a compromise will by definition, if one is reached, uh, reflect uh, some of what each side wants. So that is highly achievable and it's, and, and it's not necessary to pursue and engage in budget negotiations under threat of default or continued right. shutdown. But before I let you go, sure. I mean, obviously everyone's going to be in town this weekend. The international markets will be weighing and monitoring what happens this weekend very carefully. It'll be the last time before we start really getting closer to this October 17th mm -hmm. deadline. Do you not agree that there is something very important about what does or does not happen either here or on the floor of the House and Senate this weekend on this question? Well, I certainly agree that that's not that we're, we're long a sense past of to these time when people ought to be able to go back to, should have been able to go back to work and the government should have been reopened and and we're obviously coming very close to a deadline uh, that would put us beyond where we've ever been before where the United States of America would not have the capacity to borrow and would only be able to use cash on hand to pay its bills and that uh, would be by any serious economist's reckoning uh, a very uh, dangerous place for the United States. Uh, and uh, we should not get there. And the President certainly hopes that uh, Congress acts to uh, remove that threat uh, as, as soon as possible. Carrie Budoff Brown. <coughs> um, is the source of uh, disagreement right now with the House GOP proposal that uh, there is a, you know, putting entitlement reforms on the table and Medicare means testing, but not 
revenue, a promise of looking at revenue as well in budget negotiations. Is that one issue that the White House has with this? What, what I'll say, Carrie, is A, that I'm not going to get into specifics about, you know, conversations and proposals that uh, are being discussed. I will say broadly that the President believes that tough choices have to be made and can be made as part of a compromised budget agreement that moves our country forward and uh, reduces the deficit. He has a proposal on the table that would uh, deal with this over a 10-year period and would reduce our deficit beyond, you know, would buy back the sequester and then reduce the deficit beyond what uh, is uh, achieved through sequester. So, uh, and, and that would include, in a balanced way, uh, some of the kinds of reforms that uh, we're seeing discussed today. But remember, that was part of a broad package uh, and a balanced package. The fact that there's interest by both parties in both houses in uh, buying back or the sequester is a good thing in our view. And we're certainly interested in budget negotiations that uh, try to tackle that challenge and that shared goal and, and in budget negotiations that would look at a variety of means of achieving that. Um, so having said that, I'll restate that, uh, you know, we, we need to continue to have conversations and, and the House and the Senate and Democrats and Republicans uh, need to continue to have conversations. Uh, it is our view that it's very important to remove the threat of default uh, from this process uh, and uh, to open the government as soon as possible. But if, if entitlements are put on the table specifically, which I seem to the white and the GOP seems to have done, does the president need revenues to be specified as well that that is also going to be Again, Kerry, I'm not going to, because we're, we're talking about a very fluid situation. The President's position is reflected in his budget when you talk about comprehensive, broad, long-term uh, budget negotiations, I mean, uh, budget negotiations that try to achieve a comprehensive, long-term deal. And the President's position has always been that we need to, when it comes to deficit reduction, tackle that in a balanced way. And that's reflected in his budget with, uh, through both savings from entitlement reforms and uh, saving th through tax reform. Uh, you know, we're not at the point of negotiations like that. Uh, the President's been eager to have those negotiations all year long and has met repeatedly with Republicans over the course of the year uh, in an effort to try to find that common ground on these very issues. And he looks forward to doing so again. But we need to uh, continue to explore the possibility of resolving this imminent, this real and uh, current conflict that has led them to shut down the government and threaten default, uh, and then we can move on to broader uh, negotiations over how we achieve our budget priorities. Sure. Is that satisfactory? Jay, on that question of a Chuck. Big, uh, on the uh, issue of, can you just sort of clarify, are you, are you negotiating something or not? Because the stance has been no negotiation, but there's clearly and it I is know absolutely you guys are, are sure. I mean, it seems clear that if the Republicans open up the government, you guys have agreed to give them something in return. Is that, or else you wouldn't be in the midst of trading proposals? Here, here, Not to get pedantic here, but it does seem as if you have moved off the position of we're not negotiating. Well, I think you need to remember what our position is specifically, and I understand the question. The President uh, is absolutely committed to the proposition that. Uh, the American people should not and cannot pay ransom in exchange for Congress doing its job uh, when it comes to uh, its fundamental responsibilities of ensuring that the government stays open or, uh, even more importantly, ensuring that the United States pays its bills. Uh, when it comes to the debt ceiling, which will be breached for the first time in our history in just a few days if Congress doesn't take the necessary action, uh, it is absolutely his view that, um, you know, demands for uh, ransom of any kind, any kind of uh, extraction of a concession from him or from the American people through him are unacceptable in exchange for ensuring that we do not default. Uh, when it comes what to- What is he offering then? He must be offering something or, I mean, put it this way, there are a lot of people on Capitol Hill, there are a lot of House Republicans and a lot of Senate Republicans that have come away from this meeting believing, okay, the President is now going to at least give us something. Well. Uh, I think that the conversations, at the very least, when it comes to what Republicans have heard from the President, uh, have reinforced 
what the President has tried to convey through his proposals and through what he said publicly and privately, uh, that he is serious about finding compromise when it comes to our budget challenges, and that he wants to get to work resolving them and believes that uh, there are, in both houses, uh, potential partners with both Democrats and Republicans to achieve that compromise. But so he it's won't. It's fair to say that if there is something they come up with from your, what would be future budget talks to open up the government right now and John Boehner needs it to get the votes, you guys are like, fine. Is that <laughs> what, what, that's what uh, we're looking at here? You're basically, you're saying, fine, it's something we would have given you in the budget negotiations if you need it earlier to get the votes to reopen the government. We're well, not going to. We're, I don't, we're not gonna I don't think it's possible to draw a achieve a comprehensive budget agreement of the kind that's reflected in the president's ten-year proposal in a matter of days. Uh, you know, unless there's unless there's a sudden there's willingness by Republicans to. Like. Uh, well, I think you know, therein lies the rub, right? So, we believe that precisely because uh, budget negotiations are a complicated business. Uh, and each side has uh, principled views that uh, they should not be conducted under the cloud of continued shutdown and certainly not conducted uh, under the threat of default. Uh, that's been our position all along. I mean, they're, it, it's probably made for uh, less interesting copy, but there's been enormous consistency in our statement of that position from the beginning here. And it's, and it's fair to say that that position reflects some lessons learned from what happened in 2011. And what we can't do is recreate the 2011 experience for the American people, because they paid a significant price just for the flirtation with default that Republicans engaged in two years ago. Can you give the uh, President's or the White House version of events of the Ted Cruz back and forth? No. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to read out beyond what I've said, the, the meeting itself. Right, my understanding, Senator, gave a pretty impassioned question about the health care law and that the president gave a pretty somewhat dismissive answer to to Senator Cruz's question. Again, I don't have uh, uh, any further readout on what the president thought was a constructive meeting. Carol? Um, thanks. To, just to clarify, did the president convey in his conversation with the speaker that he wants a longer term debt limit increase and that can you just clarify that? Well, I don't have anything more uh, specific to read out from the conversation itself. I can say our position is, and our position in public is the same as it is in private, that uh, it is the right thing to do uh, to remove that gun from the table, the negotiating table, ensure that the debt ceiling is raised for uh, as long a duration as possible so that it is not that no one's tempted, in this case, only Republicans have been tempted, but no one is tempted to use the threat of default uh, as a means of extracting political concessions. Did um, some of the Senate Republicans came away from their meeting with the President with the impression that he's backing away from his support for something short term? Is that, from your guys' perspective, an accurate uh, Well, what I happen? would say is that it has never been our desired outcome that Congress only reopen the government for a short term or Congress only lift the debt ceiling for a short term. That is, and I think I've said this uh, verbatim in the past, the least they could do. Uh, so is it still acceptable uh, as the bare minimum? Sure. Uh, it better, I mean, it's absolutely, if the, if the Congress were to pass a clean debt ceiling of short duration uh, to avoid default, the President would sign that. But as I've said in the past, whether the Congress extends the debt ceiling for a short term or a medium term or a long term, the President's position on uh, re refusing to pay ransom in exchange for Congress fulfilling their responsibility to pay the, UN you know, the bills of the United States will not change. And then lastly, does the White House see promise in Senator Collins' proposal, given your desire for something longer? Is that a, an avenue that you think might be more fruitful? I would say that a number of uh, lawmakers uh, in the Senate as well as the House have expressed uh, uh, views that are constructive in, in our estimation. Senator Collins is one of them, but I, I'm not going to evaluate from here a specific proposal uh, beyond what I've said thus far. Mark? Jay, uh, Jay um, did you answer Chuck by saying that, yes, 
these talks and meetings and phone calls and conversations amount to negotiating? Or are you still avoiding that word what deliberately? I, or What I would say is that our position hasn't changed. Our position that uh, there's no uh, ransom that can be paid. And, and, you know, when you say negotiation, if you mean it in the terms of, uh, like, you extract from one side what you want in return for something else, when it comes to raising the debt ceiling, the President firmly believes that it's not uh, good for the American people or the American economy or the global economy uh, for any president of either party or any party in the future uh, to pay the opposition party a political price in exchange for it fulfilling that fundamental responsibility. Because you get into a situation which we're now experiencing and which we experienced in 2011, whereby one faction of one party uh, manufactures a crisis that does harm to the economy and harm to the American people. And we ought not do that because uh, it's a complicated piece of business with an unfortunate term attached to it, the debt ceiling, but it is really simply about authorizing the United States government to pay the bills that Congress has incurred. Uh, so not paying those bills uh, would make us uh, a deadbeat nation, and that is something that I don't think any American reasonably would find acceptable. I understand that, but you said earlier the President has a number of concerns with the proposal from the House Republicans. That sounds like negotiating. The President... Can we use, can we use that word or you can You can use any word you want to describe it. That's the beauty of the free press. But the... Uh, uh, but does it come with a Jay Carter phone call after? Well, <laughs> uh, maybe an email or a, the beauty of the a first tweet. Amendment for you. But, uh, Saying that we're, we believe that conversations have been constructive and that the proposal that uh, Republicans from the House have put forward represents, uh, in part, uh, progress, uh, I think reflects where we are in this. That doesn't... You don't know, want to use that word. Again, we're not, when it comes to raising the debt ceiling... No, it, I, I understand all so, of that. I'm just saying so just back and forth. That's at, negotiating, well, we're, right? Well, we're, we're, we're listening and we're talking. All right, one last question. <laughs> last evening, the President signed the mini-funding bill to uh, restore funding to uh, military death benefits. A yes, day earlier, did. you had said it wasn't necessary, he didn't need it, wasn't going to sign it. What changed his mind? <laughs> well, at the time, the legislation had not uh, reached his desk, and he had asked his chief of staff uh, to find a creative solution to this problem as soon as possible. And uh, thanks to the uh, generosity of uh, the Fisher House and its willingness to help us deliver these uh, benefits to uh, families. Uh, an agreement was reached between the Department of Defense and the Fisher House that uh, was a temporary solution to this problem. Now, the legislation, obviously, uh, once passed and signed into law, uh, obviates the need for that. So my point all along uh, was that you know, the way to resolve that problem and all these problems uh, instantly is to reopen the government and to restore funding at levels that Republicans themselves uh, felt were appropriate uh, for the previous fiscal year. And, uh, you know, so that when the legislation was passed and, and the President was able to sign it, he did because he felt it was very important that these benefits be guaranteed. Uh, he is enormously appreciative of the generosity of the Fisher House and uh, of the work done by uh, folks at OMB and DOD and uh, to, to come up with uh, a solution that appeared to be needed uh, because, uh, you know, it is essential that these benefits be provided. Then is it no longer a matter of principle that President Obama will not sign any other of these many funding bills? Well, Mark, as you know, he signed the Pay Our Military Act. Right. And, and yeah, because of the enormous uh, and unique uh, sacrifice that our military families uh, provide. Uh, it is absolutely our position that attempts to uh, solve a political problem by their decision to shut down the government through piecemeal legislation uh, are not, are, are gimmicks, broadly speaking. And that the way to resolve this political problem for the Republicans and the way to resolve this real problem and this real pain that uh, their decision to shut down the government has caused the American people is to reopen the government. Again, uh, the, the, the proposition that we've always put forward that Leader Reid and Leader Pelosi agreed with was that we should 
the Congress should pass uh, a bill that would extend government funding levels uh, at you know, extend government funding at the levels that were set for the previous fiscal year for a relatively short duration to allow for substantive budget negotiations. Uh, you know, from the light of the very little light of today, uh, I think it's pretty clear that that's an entirely reasonable position and hardly represents uh, a, a demand uh, or a concession to the President or the Democrats to go along with that. So that's why we've taken that position. And, and all of this hardship that the American people have experienced thus far and the confusion and the, you know, the real uh, suffering as well as the inconvenience could have been avoided and can be uh, avoided in the future if, if the Congress, the House, would simply uh, reopen the government. Jay. Chrissy. Thank you, Jay. Some senators left here today thinking the President is open to some tweaks to the Affordable Care Act. But don't cut it, but <coughs> just tweak it. Is that accurate? The President has said, I think publicly many times, that he is uh, open to uh, suggestions from any quarter about how to improve uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, make its, uh, it, you know, the benefits that it provides to the American people uh, better and more efficiently delivered. And, uh, you know, he understands that there, with any kind of uh, program like this and legislation like this, that as was the case with Social Security and Medicare and Medicare Part D and the child, the children's health insurance program, there, uh, there are ways to improve it. He doesn't doubt it. What, what he, of course, won't accept is uh, improvements or actually efforts to do away with the Affordable Care Act that come in the guise of uh, improvements or delays or modest defunding or things. I mean, you know, what I don't think, I mean, I think we've talked about it here that some of the uh, you know, ideas that have obviously been pretty firmly rejected by a majority of the American people that have been put forward by Republicans as part of this debate uh, and, and gussied up as mere. Uh, adjustments or delays of the Affordable Care Act were uh, sincere efforts to try to eliminate it indirectly. And, you know, what we, you know, the President firmly believes that it's uh, important to provide access to affordable health insurance to millions of Americans, and that's what the Affordable Care Act uh, does and will do. And, and as uh, is the case now, since the marketplaces have been opening, uh, you know, individuals across the country are, are finding out that they have uh, a variety of options available to them at affordable prices to get quality health insurance that they never could have gotten before. But the delay of the medical device tax is one that is coming up again and again now. Is that, but is, does that fall under the category of delays that he would find? Well, that I think that damaging. I, 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 again, the president is open without, uh, you know threats of continued shutdown or threats of default to having serious conversations about uh, our budget priorities, budget proposals, as well as any ideas that any lawmaker might have about ways to improve the Affordable Care Act. Uh, he's willing to look at any proposal. Uh, when it comes to the one you mentioned, I think it's important to note that uh, eliminating that provision would substantially increase the deficit. Uh, so that is... Uh, something that would greatly concern him, regardless any proposal that anyone put forward, uh, would have to take into account uh, the much uh, uncommon, uh, un, um, remarked upon fact by Republicans that the Affordable Care Act reduces the deficit, again, as scored by the CBO and independent uh, economists, the Affordable Care Act uh, is a deficit reducer. It's paid for and then some uh, in, the short, in the medium and long term. So, it would be very important to the President to ensure that that principle is maintained regardless of the proposals that are put forward. Okay. All right. Uh, a couple days ago, the White House was very unhappy about Boehner's decision to show up at the White House with just 18 or 20 Republicans instead of the entire conference. But it seems like it was actually one of the most productive meetings that have happened since the shutdown. Do you regret the position the White House took? We certainly don't regret inviting every member of Congress to the White House. So I don't say that it would be less productive for Boehner to show up with a smaller group that he no, brought. No, our position was that we regretted that all members of the House weren't able to come, all members of the Republican conference, simply because uh, it is a, as Speaker of the House himself has often noted, a uh, diverse bunch with uh, uh, sometimes uh, conflicting opinions about policy and the President. And, uh, 
that it would have been useful, I think, for everyone to uh, have a face-to-face -face conversation. Having said that, uh, we still have that view, Ari, but, but it is the case that yesterday's conversation with uh, that subset, that leadership subset of the House Republican Conference was uh, constructive, and uh, we believe uh, it is the right thing to do to continue to have talks. The other thing I wanted to ask was you said um, Republicans suddenly seem to have come around to the view that the threat of default is Some not of them have. good. Some of them have. Do you think um, the timing of that view coinciding with the Wall Street Journal uh, NBC poll showing terrible numbers for Republicans was coincidental? Uh, were I still a reporter covering Congress and Republicans in Congress, as I once did, uh, it's possible I could reach that conclusion. I would encourage uh, my former colleagues and those who are doing what I used to do to dig a little deeper into the bigger issues, which, you know, I think reflects what I was saying earlier. It's not, you know, whatever the motivation is, it's always been our position that if you're taking action in Washington that hurts the American people and hurts the American economy, it's probably not going to be very popular, at least broadly across the nation. Uh, so I think that, that may be what is reflected in, in some of this data. But the, the, the fact of the matter is nobody wins when uh, Washington is dysfunctional and one party holds the whole process hostage to demands that are unreasonable. So, uh, you know, hopefully there's a recognition that we need to move away from that dynamic and instead, you know, open the government, remove the threat of default, and, and engage in a serious-minded uh, negotiation where I can promise, <laughs> we've always said that, open the government, remove the threat of default, and let's, let's negotiate about uh, our budget priorities. And I promise you that that negotiation will result uh, that, that if there is a conclusion to that negotiation that is a compromise, that would mean that each, guy, each side got some of what it wanted, uh, but neither side got all of what it wanted. And that is how it should be. And that is the spirit in which the President has always approached this process, recognizing that, you know, we have a, a system of government with two strong parties that are, uh, you know, represented in different proportions in each House and uh, Congress, as well as here at the White House, and that no one gets everything he or she wants when it comes to these kinds of negotiations. And, uh, you know, these things are hard enough that, you know, it's not the right approach to take then to somehow achieve what you want by threatening default or threatening to, you know, shut down the government and keep people out of work uh, for a sustained period of time. That's, that's always been our position. It hasn't been a position that then, you know, don't do these things and therefore we get everything we want. The President knows full well that uh, he's not going to get everything he wants. His budget proposal, you know, recognizes that uh, from the outset. Thanks, Jim. Okay. One more. Steve Dennis from, and then Cheryl. Uh, so, <coughs> it seems like you've moved and Democrats I probably shouldn't have called on him, right? <laughs> 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 A little too plugged in. Um, but never mind, he can't think of what to say, Cheryl. <laughs> I, I, I want to be careful with this because you've been dancing around the negotiation question. Uh, for weeks now, you guys have wanted a clean CR, and now it seems you're willing to negotiate a mini deal that would be attached to a clean CR. Things with give and take, things that you want, things that the Republicans want, attached to a clean CR, so you'd have a policy sidecar, not just a process sidecar. Uh, that's new. No, let, let, I understand the question, and, and it's a smart one. But here's, let me be clear. Our position has always been that at the very least, Congress ought not to allow the government to shut down, that Republicans should not shut down the government, and that the House of Representatives should do what the Senate did, which was pass a clean CR funding the government at levels set in the previous fiscal year by largely Republicans. So uh, it has also been our position that we envision a bigger and broader and more substantive budget compromise that uh, achieves some of the goals that the President's been talking about for a long time. And those goals include continued deficit reduction. They include uh, 
you know, dealing with the problem of the sequester, and they include, uh, you know, key investments in areas of our economy and our middle class that will help us uh, grow stronger in the future and create more jobs. So uh, both are true. At the very least, uh, our position has been that the Republicans should not have shut down the government, that when it became clear they weren't going to get what they wanted in return for, uh, you know, when the fiscal year ended, uh, that they should have done uh, the very least, which is what the Senate did, and that is pass an extension of spending at current levels short term to allow for further budget negotiations. Instead, they chose to shut the government down to try to use, uh, you know, the pain and suffering of the American people and the harm to the American economy as leverage to get what they wanted. I think it's fair to say that hasn't worked for them. We are encouraged uh, by the constructive approach that Republicans have taken in conversations uh, with the President and others uh, in uh, recent hours and days. Uh, but we don't have an agreement yet. So is it fair to say that you're willing to negotiate and are trying to negotiate um, any deal that gives both sides something <coughs> that they want that would not be considered a ransom, which is still there won't be a ransom? I don't think, I mean, no, I don't, I don't think I can characterize uh, the conversations that way. What we are looking for is a way to, uh, to see if the Congress, and in particular Republicans in the Congress, uh, in agreement with Democrats, can reopen the government, uh, which is something we've asked them to do from day one, uh, and then remove the threat of default, uh, f you know, from this whole process. That's our position and our view, and it's one that we've expressed. We have seen constructive signs and appreciate them coming from the Republican side uh, and uh, believe, as the Speaker said uh, or his uh, spokesman said in their readout of the phone call with the President, uh, that it's important to continue to talk, that all sides continue to talk. Cheryl, last one. Okay. Really concretely, no. what is the next <laughs> step? Are you waiting well, I don't know. for Boehner to come back with a new proposal tonight? I, I really don't have, I think it's uh, fair to say that when it comes to specifics about talks and conversations uh, that I'm not going to have a lot to offer you uh, today. It's pretty evident, right? So, uh, well, okay. the President talked to Speaker Boehner. Is, is he waiting for now a new I, I would refer you to the Speaker. What I can say is what uh, the Speaker spokesman said, which is that the President and he agreed to continue talking. Uh, and that all sides should continue talking, and that we think uh, uh, what we've seen thus far represents uh, a constructive approach, and hopefully uh, Congress will reach an agreement of some kind that will allow them to open the government, uh, reopen the government, and remove the threat of default uh, from this whole process, because it's uh, enormously damaging uh, to the economy and to the American people. Over the weekend, Jay, did you hold off? Over the on this I don't have any scheduling updates. I mean, obviously, uh, we'll keep you updated uh, as we have more information about uh, things happening here, but I have nothing uh, on tomorrow's schedule or Sunday or Mondays at this. <laughs> don't have one. It's a fairly fluid situation. Yeah. Uh, I, I certainly have no uh, scheduling uh, announcements of that kind to make. Uh, I don't expect to make them. I don't expect that, but you, I mean, I would, I would never, you know, we'll, the normal process we follow of giving a lid and things like that will be followed in this case. Thanks all. Jay, yeah. if, if President Obama had done the Asia trip, would he have gone to um, Afghanistan today?